Hello YouTube. So there's a common assumption in much contemporary philosophy that philosophers should defer to experts in other fields with respect to certain philosophical claims. So that is, the idea is that other disciplines make claims that bear on philosophical questions and where there is a consensus among the experts in those other disciplines about those claims, philosophers ought to accept those claims. So philosophers ought not to hold philosophical positions that contradict well-established claims in science and mathematics. As a result, there are various philosophical disputes that have basically been solved by these other disciplines. Uh, this view is known as deferentialism, and it's discussed in the article Deferentialism by Chris Darley and David Liggins, so I'll be drawing on their work here. Um, now, presumably, few people would doubt that there are at least some context in which philosophers should defer to experts in other fields. I mean, if I want to know uh, what is the evidence for the claim that smoking causes cancer, well, the obvious place to look would be the research conducted by epidemiologists. Other things being equal, I should put more weight on the testimony of an epidemiologist than on, than on the testimony of a philosopher with respect to that question. Um, so, you know, in that kind of case, deference is uncontroversial. Where deference becomes a little bit more controversial is the idea that there are philosophical positions that can be ruled out by the results from other fields, regardless of the quality of the philosophical arguments that bear on those philosophical positions. So a clear statement of this sort of deferentialism is given by David Lewis. This comes from his article, Parts of Classes. And Lewis is here criticising views in philosophy of mathematics, such as fictionalism and intuitionism. <clears throat> So according to fictionalists, there are no mathematical objects. So all mathematical statements are false. Well, false or vacuously true. Um, but a statement like there are prime numbers greater than 100, that's just going to be straightforwardly false because according to the fictionalist, there are no numbers. Uh, numbers don't exist. There are no abstract objects. There are no numbers. So when we say there are prime numbers greater than 100, that's actually just false. Uh, the fictionalist views mathematics as a kind of useful fiction. Um, Lewis thinks that this is absurd. He says, and I quote, mathematics is an established going concern. Philosophy is as shaky as can be. To reject mathematics for philosophical reasons would be absurd. If we philosophers are puzzled by the classes that constitute mathematical reality, that's our problem. We shouldn't expect mathematics to go away to make our life easier. Even if we reject mathematics gently, explaining how it can be at most a useful fiction, good without being true, we still reject it, and that's still absurd. So the point is, there are some philosophical theories that are inconsistent with well-established claims in mathematics. And given a conflict between philosophy and mathematics, we should favour mathematics. Um, so Dali and Liggins define this kind of deferentialism as follows. If a philosophical theory is inconsistent with well-established claims in mathematics, then we should reject the philosophical theory for that reason alone, right? Like, that's enough to take that philosophical theory off the table. Um, so, you know, the idea here is not merely that philosophers should take mathematics seriously or that they should be informed by what's going on in mathematics. I mean, that's totally uncontroversial. Uh, the idea is that when philosophical claims are shown to conflict with the content of mathematics, the philosophical claims must be rejected, no matter how strong the philosophical arguments for those claims seem. So, you know, this sort of deferentialism contrasts with uh, a kind of weaker idea, which is that, you know, if, if some proposition P is part of well-established mathematics, then we have good reason to believe that P. But of course, a good reason to believe that P is defeasible, right? This sort of view would leave it open that our reason to believe that P can be defeated, perhaps by a philosophical argument. The deferentialist is claiming that philosophy can never supply the sorts of reasons that would outweigh the, you know, the force of, of mathematics. Um, so another common kind of deferentialism is deference to science. So this would say that if a philosophical theory is inconsistent with well-established claims in science, then we should reject the philosophical theory for that reason alone. Again, that's not, that's not saying simply that philosophers should take science seriously, that philosophers should be informed by science. It's saying that 
Like, science is a trump card. Interestingly, Lewis himself did not extend his deferentialism to science, at least not to physics. Um, so he explicitly says in the introduction to his uh, second volume of Philosophical Papers that he is, and I quote, not ready to take lessons in ontology from quantum physics as it now is. He says that first it must be purified of instrumentalist frivolity, of double-thinking deviant logic, and of supernatural tales about the power of the observant mind to make things jump. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that most philosophers with naturalist inclinations uh, are not going to share Lewis's suspicion of quantum physics. Um, and I mean, you know, it's fair enough, right? I mean, it's not, it's not really clear what, uh, what would motivate deferentialism in one case, but, uh, but not in the other. Quantum physics is one of the most powerful empirical theories we've ever constructed. Granted, it does tell us many strange and surprising things, but then mathematics tells us many strange and surprising things as well. You know, you've got imaginary numbers and non-Euclidean geometries and different cardinalities of infinity, and there's even what Lewis calls double-thinking deviant logic to be found in some branches of mathematics. So, um, anyway, uh, anyway, like that's somewhat of a tangent. The point is, uh, deferentialism to science, right, this is going to say, well, if a philosophical theory is inconsistent with established theories in science, the theory has to go, the philosophy has to go. So, um, uh, one example of this, just to give a couple of examples of deference in science, one example of this is uh, arguably found in debates about the philosophy of time. So, um, according to presentism, only the present exists, only the present moment. Uh, there, there's like the past and the future, none of, none of the, the thing, you know, things that we take to be in the past and future don't actually exist. There's only the present. This contrasts with eternalism, which holds that the past, present and future all exist. They are all on the same metaphysical footing. So the eternalist will model time as being uh, essentially just another dimension like space. The, the temporal now, the temporal present, is no more metaphysically special than the spatial here. Right. So to say that you know, this moment that a certain thing is happening now, that's, you know, that, that doesn't have any sort of more metaphysical significance than to say that uh, something is happening here rather than over there. Um, so that's the, that's the eternalist, right? The presentist, on the other hand, thinks that the temporal now, the temporal present, is metaphysically special. So the presentist is committed to there being a set of physical events that are all objectively simultaneous with each other. There must be some set of physical events that all occur at the same time, and this set of physical events is all that exists. This is the present. Across the whole universe, or even the multiverse, if there be such a thing, there is the set of presently existing physical things, and that's all that there is. And this set undergoes change, as new things come into existence and other things cease to exist, but there's always some set of things that are objectively present. Now, the problem with this is that, according to special relativity, there is no such thing as absolute simultaneity. Whether or not two events are simultaneous with each other depends on the observer's reference frame, and there is no privileged reference frame. There's no reference frame that is uniquely connect correct. So consider a situation where there are two observers. From observer 1's point of view, event A and event B occur simultaneously. From Observer 2's point of view, event A occurs before event B, so the events are not simultaneous. Crucially, both observers may be correct. Simultaneity is relative to one's reference frame, and there's nothing that privileges either observer's reference frame over the other. Um, which means presentism, we have presentism, which assumes, or seemingly assumes, absolute simultaneity. Then we have special relativity, which seemingly denies absolute simultaneity. If we endorse deferentialism to physics, then we will just conclude from this alone, right? Presentism is false. Presentism is off the table. Um, and, you know, no philosophical argument is going to be able to, you know, restore presentism um, to respectability. Um, or consider philosophical arguments against causality, right? There are some philosophers who deny that there is really any such thing as causality. This kind of view is often inspired by people like David Hume. It's been explicitly defended by Bertrand Russell in his article on the notion of cause. But many fields of science make causal claims. You know, they, we, we hear things like 
smoking causes cancer, or burning fossil fuels causes global warming. Anti-realism about causality seems to, well, I mean, it, it just does straightforwardly contradict uh, these sorts of claims, right? It straightforwardly contradicts the many causal claims that are considered to be well established in science. We, I mean, we have to say, if we, if we say that there, strictly speaking, is no genuine causality, then we have to say that, strictly speaking, it's false that smoking causes cancer. Um, so again, deference to science would rule out anti-realism about causality. It's, and, and again, no philosophical argument is going to put uh, this sort of anti-realism about causality back on the table. <clears throat> so why exactly um, should we defer in this kind of way? But what's the what's the argument for this sort of deference? Well, Lewis uh, further writes, he says, Can you tell mathematicians with a straight face to follow the philosophical argument wherever it may lead? If they challenge your credentials, will you boast of philosophy's other great discoveries, that motion is impossible, that a being than which no greater can be conceived cannot be conceived not to exist, that it is unthinkable that there is anything outside the mind, that time is unreal, that no theory has ever been made at all more probable by the evidence, and so on, ad nauseum. Uh, so yes, you know, the philosopher comes along and says, look, um, you know, we've, we've discovered there are no numbers. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are no mathematical objects, right? So all of these mathematical claims are actually false. It's all just a useful fiction. Um, now, as if the mathematician challenges us, I mean, what are we going to point to, right? Um, what has philosophy ever ever established that, that should make us tr trust what the philosopher says more than what the mathematician says. I mean, this is, I, I think, <clears throat> really the sort of key intuitive argument for deferentialism. Um, mathematics and science both have extremely good track records. There's been an enormous amount of progress in both fields. By contrast, the track record of philosophy leaves much to be desired. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty damn poor, right? Philosophers don't really seem to have established much of anything. Uh, so we should place a higher trust in mathematics and science than we place in philosophy. No matter how good a philosophical argument might seem, we can be confident on the basis of the track records of these disciplines that the well-established claims of science and mathematics are much better supported. Even the most brilliant philosophical arguments are... They always are, will be shown to be flawed in a variety of ways. You know, no matter how, like you take the best arguments ever produced by a philosopher, and you can find a hundred other philosophers who've poked holes in them. Um, <clears throat> so, so like, look, when philosophers are holding positions that are inconsistent, that are just straight up inconsistent with what's said in mathematics and science, we really should reject those philosophical positions. We should side with mathematics and science over philosophy. I suppose another point here is just that. Different disciplines have different areas of specialisation. Mathematicians are the people who specialise in mathematics, so if you want to learn about something that has to do with mathematics, it makes sense to consult the mathematician. Mathematicians are better placed than philosophers to tell us whether certain mathematical entities exist, just as mathematicians are better placed than biologists to tell us about mathematics. Uh, like Even if we think that philosophy does have a good track record with respect to philosophical problems, well, it surely doesn't have such a good track record with respect to mathematical problems. Mathematics is the only discipline that has a good track record with respect to mathematical problems. So why the hell would you pay any attention to a philosopher who's saying that, you know, numbers don't exist? Um, okay, so this is the, this is the basic argument. Uh, now, there are a couple of different ways to interpret what this argument is saying. Um, the most straightforward interpretation is that what it's saying is that it, it sort of rests on the premise that disciplines such as mathematics and science have a better track record of uncovering the truth. So the idea would be that, well, look, mathematicians as a group are very good at uncovering truths about mathematics. Physicists as a group are very good at uncovering truths about physics. Philosophers don't seem to be good at uncovering the truth about anything, so that's what means these other disciplines are more trustworthy. Now, we have to be a bit careful when we frame the argument in this way, though, because <clears throat> if we frame it in this way, then it looks like the argument is going to become question-begging, at least in the context of some debates. So we've seen that Lewis wanted to use deferentialism about mathematics to rule out fictionalism about mathematics. Again, you know, fictionalist says, 
all mathematical claims are false, or at least they're, they're false or vacuously true. Um, now, the track record argument assumes that mathematics has a good track record of producing non-vacuous truths about mathematics, but that's just what the fictionalist denies. I mean, as the fictionalist sees it, there is no such good track record. So if we interpret the track record argument in this way, it would it would just straightforwardly beg the question against the fictionalist. I mean, clearly the fictionalist, a, a mathematical fictionalist, is certainly not going to get on board with the idea that mathematicians have a good track record of uncovering substantial mathematical truths. You know, and, and when you point to things like, well, look, you know, mathem mathematics has established that there are prime numbers greater than 100, and we can, you know, we can see, we can see all of these, you know, interesting mathematical claims that have been shown to be true. The fictionalist is going to say, well, no, right, none of that's true. There is no such track record. Um, now, of course, the track record argument interpreted as an argument about truth that that may not be question begging in other contexts. So um, deference to physics in debates about philosophy of time, for instance, presentism does not involve the claim that all physical theories are false or anything along those lines. The presentist may well accept the premise that physics has a better track record of getting at the truth than philosophy does. So, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be question begging to frame the argument in this way if we're talking to a uh, you know a, a, a presentist and we want to use deferentialism in that context. But this does show the limits of this sort of deferentialism. Um, so another way that we might try to run the track record argument is to say that uh, mathematics and science have a better track record in some broader sense. They have a better track record of progress um, and. I mean, there's obviously a lot of debate about what exactly progress consists in. Uh, there's a few different ways of, of of sort of thinking about this. But at the very least, we might say, well, progress isn't a matter of uncovering truths, at least not directly. Um, but progress is perhaps more a matter of solving puzzles in ways that achieve consensus opinion. So basically, it's, you know, what, what we're looking for is convergence of opinion, problem solving, rigorous argument, and so on. Um, so when we look at mathematics and science, we find that what goes on in those disciplines is the practitioners of those disciplines can state specific problems and they have clear methods that can be applied to solve those problems and clear criteria by which to judge whether or not a problem has been solved. And as a result, we tend to find this convergence of opinion. Um, and we can then build on that convergence and ask further questions. So, you know, scientists will arrive at the con at the consensus that smoking causes cancer. And, you know, you, like, OK, maybe at first there's, there's a sort of debate about it, different, you know, there might be conflicting evidence. But over time, you know, they eventually sort of have multiple lines of evidence and they have clear criteria by which to sort of judge that, like, no, this problem has been solved now. We've now shown that there is indeed a sort of causal link between smoking and lung cancer. Uh, once they've achieved a consensus on that, they can start asking further questions. You know, they can ask, well, what is the mechanism by which smoking causes cancer? Which chemicals in cigarettes are the most carcinogenic? And so on. Now, by contrast, philosophy doesn't seem to have achieved a consensus with respect to any of its big questions. Philosophers today debate many of the same things that they were debating thousands of years ago. Um, philosophers can't agree on methodology. They can't agree on what would count as a good solution to a problem. They can't even agree on whether purported problems are even meaningful. So, like, there are some philosophers who will come along and try to sort of dissolve problems rather than solve them. You know, they'll, they'll try to show that certain problems are actually just arise from linguistic confusions or, or something. And so they're, they're not really even, you know, like when we ask a certain question, maybe we're not really even asking a... Uh, a meaningful question in the first place. Like, like the question, do numbers exist, right? There are plenty of philosophers who will say that this sort of question isn't even meaningful. Um, so philosophers can't agree on the answers to any question. They can't agree on what questions are even worth asking. And so there's been a lot less, there's been no you know, progress, right? So this is the respect in which mathematics and science has a much better track record. Now, the problem with framing the argument in this kind of way is that, well, when we're sort of talking about deferentialism, at least, we're talking in the context of philosophers who are interested in figuring out the truth of things. Um, and if we're interested in figuring out the truth of things, as opposed to merely agreeing with a consensus, then it's not really clear how this appeal to progress supports deferentialism. 
So suppose that like I want to have true beliefs about some domain D. If you can show me that there's some group G that has a good track record of producing true beliefs about D, then it will be reasonable for me to defer to the views of G. However, if all you can show is that G has a good track record of producing a consensus among the members of G about D, where there is no assumption that this consensus involves a convergence on truths about D, then it doesn't look like I have any particular reason to defer to G. Um, so, you know, for example, we might say, well, mathematics is a very good track record of, you know, working out the consequences of certain axioms in ways that achieve um, convergence of opinion. Well, I mean, that's that's clearly no argument against the mathematical fiction list. It would be a separate question whether we should believe that any of those axioms are true. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, this uh, way of putting the argument, uh, even if we might, this might give us some way in which these disciplines have better track records than philosophy, it's not clear how that supports deferentialism. Um, all right then, quick advert. If you like my videos, you can uh, sign up to my Patreon. Um, I have bonus content on there, and you know it all helps. Uh, or any any cash you can throw my way helps keep the channel going. Um, and so yeah, like I say, right? If you want if you want more of me, if you want to see you know some of my further thoughts on some of these topics that I talk about on the videos, sign up to the Patreon. Um, or you can just uh, if you want to support my channel, you can throw me some cash on PayPal. Uh, I also offer private tutoring in philosophy. Uh, I have a degree, PhD, and master. I have a degree, masters, and PhD in philosophy. So those, that's my background. Um, and there's a Discord which you can join. The links to all of this will be in the description. And if you don't want to do any of that, at the very least, if you've made it this far in the video, you could give it a like, give it a comment. Any sort of engagement helps. You know, it helps the algorithm. Okay. So let's get more eyes on this video if we can. So help me out. Leave a comment. Okay then, um, let's get back to uh, <clears throat> let's get back to deferentialism. We'll look at some objections to deferentialism. All right then. So first of all, if we claim that philosophical positions must be rejected whenever they contradict the content of science or mathematics, well, we need to specify what the content of science or mathematics is. But this is something that is very much open to philosophical debate. It really isn't actually that obvious what like okay what exactly is the content of mathematics and science um so let's take fictionalism right lewis says fictionalism is inconsistent with mathematics the fictionalist claims there are no numbers so strictly speaking two plus two equals four is false um now does mathematics assert the existence of numbers does mathematics strictly speaking assert that two plus two equals four um now i should note that of course, fictionalists themselves, they will grant that mathematics does indeed assert such things. I mean, that's partly what makes them fictionalists. Fictionalists take mathematical statements at face value, as it were. So when a mathematician says two plus two equals four, the fictionalist is going to interpret her statement literally, and she's going to interpret this as committed to the existence of the number two and the number four. But since there are no numbers, the statement is strictly speaking false. So Fictionalists would agree with Lewis that their position does contradict the content of mathematics. But the problem, but the thing is, when it comes to, to deferentialism, this is quite contentious. It's very much open to debate what the correct interpretation of mathematical statements is. So here's an alternative view. Um, we might think, look, the point of mathematics is to derive consequences from axioms. So when a mathematician says 2 plus 2 equals 4, that should be understood as an abbreviation of, of a claim such as 2 plus 2 equals 4 deductively follows from the axioms of Peano arithmetic or if the axioms of Peano arithmetic are true then 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true right so it's a we're saying if such and such then such and such so you know, similarly there are prime numbers greater than 100 that really means something like there are prime numbers greater than 100 deductively follows from the axioms of Peano arithmetic now one reason why we might take this sort of view seriously is that well there are a variety of alternative systems of arithmetic in which it would not be true that 2 plus 2 equals 4, or in which it would not be true that there are prime numbers greater than 100. So modular arithmetic, arguably, uh, is of this nature. So a modular arithmetic is, you can kind of model it by thinking of analog clocks. 
So take a 12 hour clock, right? On a 12 hour clock, if you take 10 plus five, you don't get 15. Rather, when you reach 12, you wrap back around to one. So 10 plus five equals three. So similarly, if you had a arithmetic modulo three, like a clock with three hours, then two plus two would equal one, not four. Um, so, you know, maybe this is a sort of case where like, actually we, you know, we, we don't just assert that two plus two equals four. What, what we would assert is, well, you know, given certain set of axioms, we're gonna get the two plus two equals four, but that's all we're saying. So on this view, when a mathematician says, say that there are prime numbers greater than 100, she doesn't actually assert the existence of prime numbers. All she says is that prime numbers greater than 100 can be deduced from certain axioms. She's making a conditional claim. If so-and-so is assumed as a set of axioms, then there are prime numbers greater than 100. So it's similar to how, like, I might say, if there are blue unicorns, then there are unicorns. I think everybody, yeah, pretty much everyone's going to agree with that. Like, sure, if there are, if there are, you know, if there are blue unicorns, then there are, there are just unicorns in general, right? But when I say that, I'm not asserting the existence of unicorns. Um, even people who don't believe in unicorns can agree with this conditional claim. So this sort of view is, is sometimes called if-thenism. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, in general then, there is no commitment here to the existence of mathematical objects. All that's required are the principles of deductive logic. Mathematical truth is, is then going to be just constituted by deductive proofs. Now, again, to be clear, fictionalists don't accept this interpretation of mathematical statements. But if we're, if we're objecting to fictionalism on the grounds that it's inconsistent with mathematics, it looks like we have to assume that this interpretation is wrong. And that's already philosophically controversial, right? So some philosophers will say, look, mathematicians just aren't in the business of making the sorts of existence claims that fictionalism supposedly contradicts. Uh, so the fictionalist isn't really saying anything that contradicts the content of mathematics. It's just that, you know, both the, the, uh, the Platonist and the fictionalist are mistaken about what that content actually is. Um, so this is one problem, right? Like the deferentialist is going to need to give an account of what the content of some discourse is. And there's plenty of, there's going to be a lot of philosophical debate about that. Um, and so then it becomes perhaps questionable whether we can sort of straightforwardly take certain philosophical views off the table on the grounds that they contradict the content of these disciplines. Okay, second objection pressed by Darley and Liggins is that we have to distinguish between the content of a discipline and the standards of a discipline. And Darley and Liggins worry that deferentialism often conflates these two things. For instance, one of the things that Lewis says about this is he says, uh, I'm moved to laughter at the thought of how presumptuous it would be to reject mathematics for philosophical reasons. How would you like the job of telling mathematicians that they must change their ways and abjure countless errors now that philosophy has discovered that there are no numbers? <clears throat> um, okay, so suppose that mathematics does assert the existence of numbers. So, you know, fictionalism is inconsistent with the content of mathematics. Even so, fictionalism may still be you know, perfectly compatible with the standards of mathematical inquiry. The basic standard of mathematics is that pr results in mathematics must be supported by logically valid proofs. Now, nothing stops a fictionalist from engaging in this practice. And, and in general, mathematical fictionalists do not claim that mathematicians ought to change how they assess mathematical claims. So fictionalists are not arguing that mathematical practices ought to be revised. Rather, they're trying to give an account of mathematical practice as it actually is. So, you know, they say that the theories produced by mathematics are useful fictions. It's useful to talk and reason as if there were these objects such as numbers, even though there are no numbers, really. And that's as much of a justification as mathematical practice as, as the practice requires. All the fictionalist is arguing is that we should, in more reflective contexts, give up beliefs that involve a commitment to the existence of numbers. But that doesn't mean that the practice of mathematics should be changed in any kind of way. I mean, so one way to think about this is to consider a mathematician who dabbles in philosophy and who is convinced by the philosophical arguments for fictionalism. Would we then judge this person to be any worse as a mathematician? Well, 
Surely not. I mean, the philosophical theories that you endorse make no difference to your status as a mathematician. Which, perhaps, yeah, I mean, this suggests, okay, fictionalism is not really inconsistent with mathematics in any way that matters. Or at least it doesn't matter to mathematics. Uh, now, granted, if a philosophical theory were to entail that mathematical practice needs to be reformed, this would be a bit more of a radical claim, and we might wonder whether the philosopher who in, who proposes such a theory is, you know, guilty of a, a sort of epistemic trespassing. You know, philosophy simply isn't in any position to legislate the standards of mathematical practice. But um, and and actually, to be fair, there are some philosophical theories that do this, but um, but not all of them, right? And deferentialism rules out much more than just this. Um, Similarly, consider the case of science. Must scientists believe their best scientific theories? Well, in fact, many scientists hold views of established scientific theories that appear to be somewhat less than belief. In the article Scientific Realism in the Wild, James Beebe and Finn Odelson report the results of a study on the attitudes that scientists hold towards different forms of realism. And they find that many natural scientists deny that acceptance of a scientific theory requires belief that the theory is true. Um, more, more precisely, they find a high degree of agreement with the following statement. In order to go about their daily business as scientists, scientists do not need to believe that any of the theories they rely upon provides them with a literally correct description of the world. Um, so a, a lot of scientists will agree with that. And, I mean, more generally, I think it's pretty common for scientists to, you know, emphasise, you know, they'll, they'll say things like, well, you know, theories are, are only accepted provisionally in lieu of falsification. You know, they like to emphasise that no model provides a complete picture of reality, but it, it always involves some abstraction and simplification. Um, I think these are these are things that we commonly hear from scientists themselves. Um, it seems that the methodological standards of science do not require belief in the content of scientific theories. And, and of course, as with mathematics, it's possible to be an excellent scientist, even if you do not believe the theories that you're actually putting forward. If a, if a scientist were convinced by the philosophical arguments against the existence of causality, for instance, and so they end up judging that many of the claims that they make are, strictly speaking, false, well, we wouldn't judge that this makes them in any way worse as a scientist. So Darley and Liggins raise an interesting point here, which is that, well, since the internal standards of science and mathematics apparently do not require belief in scientific and mathematical claims, deferentialism actually holds philosophers to a higher standard than the internal standards of these disciplines hold the practitioners of those disciplines. So if deferentialism is true, there's a conflict between the standards that prevail in philosophy and the standards that prevail in these other disciplines, right? If deferentialism is true, it appears that, you know, that, that yeah, like philosophers are being held to like a higher standard for some reason, um, which is, you know, like philosophers are expected to believe the theories coming out of science and mathematics, whereas the scientists and mathematicians themselves are not expected to believe that, which is a, which is a rather odd result. I mean, especially when you bear in mind that philosophy, I suppose, um, you know, often you know, the, the point of philosophy really is to sort of take a more kind of critical attitude to things, a more critical questioning sort of attitude. Um, it's, that, that's a rather odd result. I, I mean, another thing Darling Liggins point out is that there may be some conflict here with, um, with naturalistic approaches in philosophy. Um, many philosophers today endorse one form or another of methodological naturalism, uh, the view that philosophy should be continuous with science. So scientific findings should have a bearing on philosophical problems and philosophical methods should be an extension of the methods of science. Now, from this point of view, well, it looks like maybe we should be suspicious of deferentialism. It's not part of the methods of science that we must believe scientific theories. Um, moreover, I mean, science itself doesn't shy away from subjecting the foundational content of its theories to critical scrutiny. Um, again, any scientific theory is in principle open to falsification. So um, there's something perhaps, uh, you know, so perhaps it's not really in the spirit of naturalism to insist that philosophers just defer to, uh, to science and mathematics. Actually, we should be, be more critical. And this point uh, leads us to a third objection to deferentialism which is that the deferentialist ends up with uh, just endorsing a kind of unreasonably dogmatic position. 
So we would surely admit that it's at least possible that there are disciplines, well-established disciplines, that make foundational errors. And errors not just in detail, but errors in principle. Like, that's, that's possible. And presumably, I mean, one of the roles of philosophy is, you know, philosophers sort of step back from particular areas of inquiry and they, they critically examine the sorts of foundational assumptions that often go unquestioned. I mean, at the very least, it seems like we would want there to be some people who do this. Like, I mean, what would be the alternative, right? If we say that nobody should be doing that, then we would be saying, quite bluntly, that we ought never to question the foundational assumptions of any field that has produced successful theories. And, I mean, that just seems like the straightforward dogmatism. Uh, we know that there are biases and blind spots and that even successful theories can sometimes turn out to be false. Um, I mean, and, you know, consider... I mean, I suppose more recently, you know, we've seen things like uh, the replication crisis in psychology uh, and, and not just psychology that has spread to other fields as well. So, yes, biases and blind spots definitely happen. Um, so, yes, I mean, surely we, we want there to be people who critically examine foundational assumptions. Um, and it looks like philosophers are among the people who, who, who can do that. Now, perhaps it could be argued that although there ought to be some people who question the foundational assumptions of successful disciplines, this is simply not a role that is appropriate to philosophers. I mean, I, I mentioned the replication crisis. Well, of course, the replication crisis in psychology was prompted by mainly by the work of psychologists, not by philosophers. Uh, so we might think, look, the way this works is that science is self-correcting. So yes, science sometimes goes wrong. And yes, it's important to question the foundational assumptions of any scientific field. But it should be the other, it should be scientists that do this, not philosophers, right? It shouldn't be the outsiders, right? <laughs> um, only, only the people who are themselves working in the discipline have the appropriate credentials to be questioning the foundational assumptions. But I mean, it's, uh, I, I suppose the question would just be like, well, what, what's, what are, the, what are the grounds, really, for ruling philosophy out of this debate? Uh, so, yes, philosophy may not have a particularly good track record of constructing true theories, but, you know, philosophers do seem to be sometimes uh, good at raising conceptual challenges. They're sometimes good at revealing inconsistencies or other sorts of conceptual muddles. So I suppose the, the challenge the deferentialist will be to explain, like, why is it that although it's appropriate to challenge foundational assumptions in in, in mathematics and science and so on, it's not appropriate for philosophers to do this, right? For philosophers can, can never have this, this role of like questioning those assumptions. Philosophers must always defer. Um, so yeah, what, like, what, why is that? <laughs> um, okay, here's a final worry. Uh, very often, it may appear that there is a conflict between the content of theories in different fields. I noted earlier that the deferentialist might try to rule out anti-realism about causality on the grounds that this is inconsistent with the promiscuous use of causal language in science. However, many of the modern arguments for causal anti-realism are themselves drawn from reflection on the sciences. Bertrand Russell, in his article on the notion of cause, he argues for causal anti-realism partly on the basis that Although, yes, scientists use causal language, he thinks there's no room for causality in fundamental physical theories, which are expressed by mathematical equations. These equations are symmetrical and they merely express a relationship between variables that can't capture the asymmetry of causal relations. Um, more recent arguments for similarly sceptical views uh, also appeal to physics. John Norton, in his article, Causation as Folk Science, has, has made this sort of argument. I mean, now, of course, you know, this characterization of the content of physics is very controversial. Many philosophers will argue that fundamental physics does ground a notion of causality. But I, I mean, this is illustrative, right? It's in principle, different disciplines might conflict. Indeed, in principle, the claims being made even within one discipline might conflict. Fundamental physics might, you know, maybe that's a causal, while other areas of physics continue to use causal notions. Now, the thing is, this looks like it's exactly the kind of context where philosophy might be able to shed some light because philosophers, you know, their job is, one of their jobs, let's say, is to kind of step back and reflect on different fields of inquiry and try to offer a unified picture. Um, 
So philosophers might offer an anti-realist view of causality, which treats causal notions in the special sciences as a kind of useful fiction. And they might put this forward as being like, OK, this is how we can achieve a kind of integration of non-causal fundamental physics with the causal claims being made elsewhere in science, right? Like once we understand, um, you know, causality as this kind of useful fiction, we can show how fundamental physics is integrated with the rest of science in a unified way, right? So whereas like initially what we find is um, like fundamental physics, which is a causal and then other sciences which make causal claims and there's some, there, there's some apparent conflict there, right? If we can show that causality is, this, is a useful fiction, then we achieve an, a, a nice unified world view. Um, it looks like deferentialism just rules out this kind of project um, and is, is going to land us with results that are just, I mean, you know, in this kind of case, they would just be contradictory, right? You know, if we defer to fundamental physics, we deny causality. If we defer to other sciences, we affirm it. I mean, at best, all the deferentialist can do is, is just hope that this kind of conflict never arises. Uh, Wilfred Sellers once said that the aim of philosophy is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. And that means sort of critically reflecting on practices like mathematics and science. And sometimes we find that these inquiries, these practices generate conceptual confusions or even outright contradictions. And, you know, we, we want a view of the world that is coherent, such that our inquiries are all mutually integrated. If we, if all we're doing is just deferring to the content of our well-established theories, it looks like we have to give up on a large part of this project. Again, all we can do is just kind of hope that those theories are already mutually coherent. But that seems uh, very, somewhat questionable. Um, it's somewhat questionable that things will work out that way. Um, so that's it. That's all I want to talk about today. Um, I hope you found that interesting. I will see you in the next video. Bye, everybody.